Today would have been George Floyd's 48th birthday and a special event is being held in his memory. That celebration is just getting started at the intersection of 38th and Chicago and that's where we find Courtney Godfrey live for us tonight. Courtney. Yeah, BC, as you mentioned, this would have been George Floyd's 48th birthday a year and a half ago. He died here on Chicago Avenue during a police encounter. Today, you can see Chicago and 38th has turned into a memorial for George Floyd. Lots of local artists have come together and lots of community have come together to maintain this space. Uh, today, the family member was family members were here, his two of his aunts and his cousin now returning to this spot to celebrate the global impact that he's left. Spearheading this celebration is the George Floyd Global Memorial Nonprofit Foundation led by Floyd's aunt and cousin. The purpose of the foundation is to preserve everything that you see out here, the art, the statues made and maintained by this very community. The family says being out here today means everything to them. They say Floyd loved bringing people together, loved a celebration, and so that's what they want to do today. They love also that people have been coming here from around the world. Uh, the uh, cousin told a story about someone who came from Antarctica and told them that they were protesting in our Antarctica. So they love the fact that people from all seven continents have visited this site and, and that this has really became become a place for change, a, a symbol of, of what can be. Uh, in our world and in our community. And of course, uh, as you guys mentioned, this is a celebration that's going to continue into the night. We've got live music, we've got performances. Uh, and from from what I gather from everybody out here, uh, there's live music happening behind me now. This is just gonna be a fun celebration, a party, all in honor of a man that they said loved to have a good time. Guys? All right, Courtney, thank you. More than $40 million of funding is on the way from the state to help spark growth in commercial corridors across the state. The Department of Employment and Economic Development announcing the first recipients of the Main Street Economic Revitalization Program. Money will go to nonprofit partner organizations used to create jobs and help spark investment back into Main Street businesses impacted by the pandemic, civil unrest and other challenges. We really did focus on corridors, on clusters, on groupings of businesses, on areas where if you can help more than one business in a sector, that it kind of force multiplies and you see a lot better effect in that neighborhood given the number of businesses you're helping all at one time. The pandemic delivered a blow unlike anything uh, that we've seen since the farm crisis of the 1980s. And so supports like the small business relief programs through DEED early on allowed many to keep their doors open. And now these communities are really looking to the future and imagining um, something better for their main streets. Foundations in Minneapolis and St. Paul are getting about 70% of the first round of funding through the program. Another $40 million in grant money will be made available next spring. New court documents detail the defense strategy for Kim Potter's upcoming trial. They show defense attorneys are expected to argue that when former officer Kim Potter shot and killed Dante Wright, it was an accident. Potter is charged with first and second degree manslaughter. Lawyers are expected to argue that she mistook her firearm for her taser during a traffic stop last April. Prosecutors argue that Potter's actions created a greater than normal danger to others. Her trial is scheduled to begin November the 30th. A Minneapolis man is now charged for a deadly hit and run in North Minneapolis, killing a woman on a mobility scooter. 21-year-old Cameron Benson is charged with one count of criminal vehicular homicide for running a red light and then hitting a woman as she moved through that crosswalk Monday afternoon on West Broadway Avenue and Aldrich Avenue North. Benson was found and arrested the next morning after his vehicle was found crashed in a median on Highway 100 in Brooklyn Park with the interior set on fire. You probably noticed it right away when you walked outside today. There is a chill in the air. Yeah, a little bit of a breeze, very fall-like. Uh, Chief Meteorologist Ian Leonard joining us, and uh, it sounds like it'll be a theme for the next few days. I uh, actually, I walked outside before I checked the temperature this morning, and I was like, oh boy, here we go. Which 
would kind of point to the fact you weren't paying attention to the forecast last night. I was. I'm just saying. It, I'm just, it, out of love, I'm just saying that. It's just one of those things when it's, it, you know, you can say that, mm -hmm. but it's not until you actually walk outside and you deal with the reality of 46 uh -huh, degrees. Uh -huh. I'm not buying anything you're in. saying. I'm not buying it. <laughs> not buying it at all. I know what you're saying. I'm still not buying it. Look, it was a uh, it was a quiet weather day, but it was breezy and cool of note. And, and I think this is what Kelsey's talking about here. Of note. This is the first time we've ever been sub 60 degrees this late in October since the late 1800s. In other words, yeah, this was a little bit of a boom, a little bit of a punch. 54 in Hinkley, 56 in the Metro today, 57 in Faribault and Owatonna. The biggest problem is these are pretty much right on average temperatures. We've just been so spoiled. Wind was a bit of a spoiler today. Still an occasional wind gust here out of the West at 10 to 20 miles per hour. So that right now temperatures are in the 40s to mid 50s. So yes, a chill overnight, a chill tomorrow, a chill Saturday morning. Some frost. You're paying attention here, right, Kelsey? I frost on okay. Saturday. Yeah. But then as we head toward Monday, ah, ah, we got some things to talk about. We'll do it here in a few minutes. All right. Thanks, Ian. An FDA advisory panel has recommended authorizing booster shots for Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine, but only for certain people. The advisors are recommending lower dose Moderna booster shots for seniors and other high risk groups. The recommendation is non-binding, but it's a key step toward expanding the U.S. booster campaign to millions more Americans. Many people who got their initial Pfizer shots at least six months ago are already getting a booster after the FDA authorized their use last month. Tomorrow, the FDA panel will discuss booster shots for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The new COVID-19 numbers are in from the Minnesota Department of Health. Health officials reporting more than 2,900 new cases, along with 25 new deaths. All but one of the deaths took place this month. 983 patients are currently hospitalized, 255 of them in an ICU. More than 3.4 million people have gotten at least one dose of a COVID vaccine in the state. Well, fresh off taking part in a hearing with the woman who blew the whistle on Facebook and Instagram, U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar now wants to hear from parents. The senator hosted a virtual roundtable with Minnesota parents to discuss the harms the social media apps pose to kids and teens. Parents shared their concerns about the platform's content and privacy policies and how they allegedly profit off of your data. Senator Klobuchar says Facebook needs to be more transparent. The second piece of it um, is looking at these algorithms and making them more transparent and figuring out um, what we can do about that. Because right now, the tech companies, no matter how bad the content is, um, they can just do whatever they want, honestly. And well, last week, Frances Haugen testified to the Senate Commerce Committee where she shared new information about how Facebook dangerously promotes content to children. Haugen is set to meet with Facebook's oversight board in the coming weeks. At the Port of Los Angeles, officials say progress is being made toward becoming a 24-7 operation. This comes after President Biden announced the White House helped broker a deal to ease supply chain bottlenecks and get dozens of stalled ships docked and unloaded. Some critics say the president's efforts are too little, too late. It's only 72 days left to Christmas. And whether the ports are open 24 hours a day or 48 hours a day, you cannot get labor. If you cannot get labor, you cannot get trucks, you cannot get those merchandise out. New numbers today show unemployment filings are down. There were 239,000 jobless claims in the past week. That's down 36,000 from the week before. Economists say that's the lowest level since the pandemic began. It's a sign the job market has improved even as hiring has slowed in the past two months. One wolf pack in Minnesota is stronger than ever. The Voyager Wolf Project says all five of the pups in its Paradise Pack are alive and well. That is a big change from last year when all four pups died by July. Now this video caught in September shows the pack, including mom, dad and all five of those pups. 
The Voyager Wolf Project says that they originally thought three of the pups had died in this pack, but this video now proving them wrong, and that's really good news for them. And some more good news to share. The Minneapolis Animal Care and Control says all of their dogs and cats have gone home to new owners. The city held its annual Clear the Shelter event Tuesday and Wednesday. All adoption fees for cats and dogs were waived. The city says 20 dogs and 17 cats were adopted over just the past two days. To keep the momentum going, the organization says it will continue to offer free adoptions for a while longer. Yeah. What great incentive. Great news. They've yeah. been doing a great job this week mm -hmm. of finding those animals' homes. <laughs> Still ahead, how the Vikings are preparing for their matchup against the Carolina Panthers. And later, hundreds of more complaints have been filed against a Midwest photography company. The plan, the company officials say, it has to help out newlyweds. Thursday Night Football is back on Fox tonight. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers will be facing off against the Philadelphia Eagles. This is a live look at Lincoln Financial Field where the match up is taking place. Kickoff is set for 720 and we'll have Vikings live coming up at 6. You can catch our news after the game tonight. Right now, though, the Vikings are preparing to take on the Carolina Panthers this weekend. Sports director Jim Rich is here, and Jim, they're really hoping for another win. Yeah, that's the whole idea right now for this team is to get some momentum on this season. It's been so choppy and broken up, and they really haven't felt like they've put it all together. Mm -hmm. And this is one more chance because the Vikings want to win for a couple of reasons. Obviously, a win is always a good thing. 
and a victory here on Sunday will get them back to 500 and two. It's always great to go into a bye with a victory, but in order to do that, the Vikings have to go and win on the road, something that they haven't been able to do so far in this young season. Today at practice, it was more about who was missing than who was out there. Once again, both wideouts, Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson, were out with various ailments, but Jefferson told reporters he should be able to go against the Panthers. Meanwhile, Dalvin Cook was a full participant for the first time since week two of the season. That certainly is good news as he continues to try to come back from that ankle injury. Patrick Peterson, the veteran quarterback, knows from history that a win before a break can be a huge momentum swing. Went into the bye week, it's nothing like it, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, um, we definitely plan on getting this win. You know, we're going to do everything in our, in our power to go out there and execute the game plan to tally up enough points and, and, you know, gather up enough stops on defense to get the dub. But, you know, this will be huge, you know, to get, get right back at 500 before um, we go into the bye week. And the Vikings also get Cam Dantzler back. He was on the COVID-19 list, but coaches are saying it may take him a little while to get him back up to speed. Vikings are currently listed as two-point favorites on the road against okay. Carolina, so that's a good sign for them as well. So it should be a, a good game, but it feels like the Vikings are kind of kicking themselves for the way that Lions game went off the rails at the end, but they were able to figure it out. And I think they've kind of realized that, you know, we, we can get this done if we just... Pay attention to detail. Yeah, and stay healthy. <laughs> That's true, too. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Well, you can watch all of the action this weekend, of course, right here on Fox 9, the official home of the Vikings. Our pregame coverage starts at 10 o'clock Sunday morning, leading up to kickoff in North Carolina at noon. Then catch Vikings postgame tonight. It airs Sunday night at 1030. And with that chill in the air, it certainly feels yeah. like football. Yeah, weather. this is like the proper tailgating yes. weather, I feel like. <laughs> Except with the wind, you're going to hold down all the paper plates and all of that stuff. <laughs> just don't, don't use plates. You just you, you only use your fingers. Well, like if the chicken fingers are there, you just grab <laughs> a chicken wing or chicken. I don't want everybody just there. putting their grubby paws and everything, though. Hello, <laughs> what kind of tailgates are you going to? <laughs> Ones with plates. <laughs> <laughs> Kelsey's like, oh, yes, I would. Mm, thank you very much. Yes, it's lovely. Thank you. I'm like, and I even put out napkins, blah. too. Yeah, no, I, that's this, the thing. That's, yeah, that's, I like napkins. That's my tailgate napkin that. right there. Yuck. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm kidding, right? I'm not. Oh. Here's Storm Vision <laughs> over the last six hours. It was a very quiet day. Started with clouds, the breeze, and the cold, just like yesterday. And yes, I used the COLD word this time because there was a definitive chill in the air this morning. A live look at Storm Vision will give you an idea. It's a very quiet night. And I'll tell you, this forecast moving forward in terms of active weather is very quiet. But in terms of temperatures, it is quite a roller coaster that started today and doesn't really end until midweek next week. These are your high temperatures today. Yes, your high temperatures. 49 in Hibbing and Alexandria, 51 in St. Cloud and Brainerd, 55 in Hutchinson and 56 in the Metro. Yes. Those are your high temperatures. Story this morning into this afternoon, a wind, sustained winds here at 10 to 20 miles per hour out of the west, still an occasional gust at 20 plus miles per hour out of the west. So you didn't have to just deal with the temperature, but you had to steel yourself against the wind and look to the north. Some chilly temperatures already on the map and we're just past 5 p.m. 46 in Alexandria, 45 in Bemidji, 45, 49 in St. Cloud. And you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, if we're already in the 40s and it's just after 5 p.m., where are we going overnight? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked it, BC. <laughs> I did. Oh, yes, you did. I, I volunteered Maybe I was, you. Yeah, thank this you. is like class. I just volunteer the people who aren't saying very much. Um, you know, it has been a very, very mild fall so far, especially October. Uh, case in point, this is our latest fall sub 60 degree day since 1872. Welcome to the fall chill. And when you look at your almanac, we hit a high of 56 today. Average is 59 below average today. That trend continues for the next couple of days. A sunset now falls on the wrong side of 630. Some fair weather cumulus clouds out there right now. 56 degrees, a dew point at 38. This isn't going to be the case because of the cloud cover. But on a clear night, the temperature can fall 
as far as the dew point. And you're saying to yourself, well, wait a minute. There's a fall chill the next few days, even a chance of frost Saturday morning, and then we'll warm up nicely into early next week. If there is a constant here, it is a very quiet stretch of weather. We clear overnight and we're cool. We wake up in the low to mid 40s tomorrow afternoon, a high of 53 with a strong wind out of the north northwest. And then tomorrow night, if you're heading out to any high school football games, you better bundle up. It is going to be a mite bit chilly. Saturday morning, some patchy frost across the region. Saturday afternoon, sunny. We slowly turn the winds out of the south. That makes for a nice day. South winds and plenty of sunshine Sunday and Monday make for a gorgeous day. And yes, finally, BC is smiling as I walk across the studio and Kelsey is handing me a napkin for the tailgate yes. this weekend. I'll be yes. fine, however it goes. Yeah, and we have a list of questions. Yeah, well, that, yes, please. You, you read my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how did you do that? It's uh, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie to you. It comes with the uh, boyish good looks and wit and charm. It, yes. It's like a package. And the science degree. That yeah. That's in there somewhere to learn too. In school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ian. Straight ahead, the TSA is reminding passengers to please check their guns after recovering a record number of weapons. And why you may be dealing with longer security lines at the airport come Thanksgiving. We'll have that in just a minute. The TSA says they have stopped a record number of passengers attempting to bring firearms through airport security. TSA saying they stopped more than 4,400 passengers trying to bring guns on planes within the first nine months of 2021. That breaks the year-long record from 2019 by 63 passengers with three months left in the year. These numbers coming from 248 airports across the country with the most reports coming from Hartsfield-Jackson Airport in Atlanta. 
followed by the Dallas, Fort Worth and George Bush Houston airports in Texas. Federal government workers must be fully vaccinated by November 22nd. That's just a few days before Thanksgiving. So you may have to get ready for long lines at the airport. The TSA says four in 10 members of its workforce, including screeners, remain unvaccinated. The deadline to get the first dose of the Moderna vaccine has already passed. The last possible date for receiving the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine is October 18th, next Monday. A couple's wedding day is often the best day in their lives so far. And pictures help those memories last a lifetime, but some couples in the Midwest are scrambling after a photography company suddenly closed. The new lawsuits filed coming up next at 5.30. Now on Fox 9 News at 530, hundreds of more complaints are filed against a Midwest photography company after it closed, leaving couples and photographers scrambling. And how a community is welcoming an Afghan refugee after he and his family fled, the Afghanistan, Af fled Afghanistan when the U.S. brought troops back home. Plus, see the makeover a Robbinsdale bar just received for the Halloween season, including the tributes to some scary movie classics. This is Fox 9 News at 530.
An update on a story we told you about last week. The lawyer for a North Dakota wedding photography company, which suddenly closed, now says they have a plan for hundreds of couples and newlyweds left scrambling and photographers looking to be paid. Yeah, Leah Bino has been following this story for a couple of days. So Leah, is anybody satisfied with this plan? Well, the short answer is no, not even close. Granted, I couldn't possibly talk to everyone impacted. The number of complaints com collected by the North Dakota Attorney General's Office has exploded from 50 last Friday to now, as of this afternoon, 480. I stressed about other stuff, but I did not stress about photography up until Thursday when we got that email. 14 days prior to her October 22nd wedding, Megan Lentz and her fiance learned Glasser Images they hired for photography was closing. Within minutes, she did what it has taken Glasser and his new attorney seven days to suggest for couples left scrambling and contacted the subcontracted photographers for her big day. Everyone was put in such a bad situation. Um, and for them to just be like, oh, reach out to your subcontractors. Um, they can help you. It's like, well, you're missing a big key piece here is money. While Lens is out a couple thousand dollars, so is photographer Brad Siegel and hundreds more. He worked seven weddings for Glasser this summer and hasn't been paid for any. He also filed complaints with the North Dakota and Minnesota Attorney General's offices. And while Glasser's new attorney suggests in this letter providing information to the North Dakota Department of Labor, Siegel is worried he may never see a dime. In my opinion, it's still very muddy. It's not clear, not clear enough what we're supposed to do. For weddings that have already taken place, like the Van Gilders, Glasser's attorney states they are attempting to make arrangements with subcontractors to provide the electronic data files and video to outside photographers and videographers. For subcontractors, there will not be copyright issues, but still, when asked about owed wages or refunds, Glasser's attorney has no comment. I want to pursue every avenue possible to get paid for the work we've done. At this point, the North Dakota Attorney AG's office has filed subpoenas for Jack Glasser and his company. Meanwhile, the Facebook group bringing people together impacted by all of this has close to two and a half thousand members. Back to you. All right, Leah, thank you. The Federal Railroad Administration has released a massive sprawling rail line that could transform travel in the Midwest for decades. The Midwest Regional Rail Plan would connect four pillar corridors to Chicago, with one of them being right here in the Twin Cities. 24 trains would run on the pillar lines each day, and 16 would run on the regional lines, with MSP connecting to Sioux Falls, Fargo, Duluth, and Madison. The 40-year plan hopes to boost ridership to 17 million annually by 2055. The Minneapolis Police Department is investigating after a seven-year-old child is struck in a hit-and-run crash. This happened at the intersection of 34th and Penn Avenue North, which is located where two schools are located. Witnesses say a white SUV drove recklessly through the intersection, striking the child who was taken to the hospital with a minor leg injury. Police are now gathering information from surveillance cameras. Anyone with information is asked to call them. President Joe Biden says vaccination is the answer to ending COVID-19. Biden says overall most of the country has falling case numbers right now. However, there are still 66 million unvaccinated Americans, and he urged more businesses to implement vaccination requirements. Let's be clear. Vaccination requirements should not be another issue that divides us. That's why we continue to battle the misinformation that's out there. The remarks come as the FDA authorize, authorizes boosters of Moderna's coronavirus vaccine. Now, a new study says mixing and matching COVID vaccines is safe and effective. The National Institutes of Health found people who did receive a booster dose of a different vaccine than they initially received had a strong immune system response. Researchers also say that people who received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may benefit more from a different booster. Troubling news out of the Pentagon, Army active duty suicide rates are up. According to reports, suicide rates among active duty Army members rose 46% in just the last few months. This comes as suicide rates within the entire military community also rise, with suicides spiking 15% just last year. Military higher ups say the issue of mental health and suicide prevention should become a top priority to better protect service members. 
If you or anyone you know is struggling, there is always help available. The National Suicide Lifeline is open 24-7 to help anyone in crisis. The number is there on your screen. It's 1-800-273-8255. Well, when the American military pulled out of Afghanistan, people in the country who once helped interpret for U.S. soldiers worried they would be left behind. But now some interpreters are moving to the U.S. thanks to American leaders and veteran organizations. Fox's Austin Westfall joins us live from Weddington, North Carolina. Austin, one interpreter there had an emotional welcome to his new community. That's right, and that interpreter goes by the name Johnny. This is the first time that he's ever been in the United States. Him and his family left their home in Afghanistan just before the Taliban took it over. So my life, my wife and three children, uh, uh, life were in danger. It's been a big week for Johnny, a former Afghan translator who worked alongside U.S. Army troops for over a decade. In Afghanistan, Johnny was worried the Taliban would target him for helping U.S. troops. If they catch me, probably they kill me or they hurt me. This is the reason I want to be here. Crowds gathered in Weddington, North Carolina to welcome Johnny and his family to their new community. The family boarded the last military flight out of Afghanistan in August with help from a group of veterans and Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina. We did all of that work so that we could make it very clear to the State Department that we had somebody who deserved to get out of the country. As Johnny arrived in North Carolina on Wednesday, he reunited with Sergeant Mike Ferrardo, who was catastrophically injured in 2010 by an IED in Afghanistan. Johnny was Ferrardo's translator then, and now they'll be living down the street from each other. Ferrardo's wife, Sarah, spoke on his behalf. That was really special. Mike, you're so happy to meet, see Johnny here. Very happy to see Johnny here. Mike and Sarah say they're not only happy for Johnny, but they're thankful that his daughters will have a chance at a new life. They were seen on a playground with other children at the welcoming event. Johnny looks forward to them starting school. This is the thing they want, so they're happy. One man here in Weddington was nice enough to give a temporary home to uh, Johnny and his family. Uh, that home is going to be provided to them for an extended period of time until they can get on their feet. Meanwhile, Senator Tillis says he's still resuming to uh, chip away at efforts in order to bring more people from Afghanistan. In Weddington, North Carolina, Austin Westfall, Fox 9. A really touching reunion there. Thank you, Austin. Well, MnDOT is pushing back some planned weekend closures for westbound lanes of 94. The closures will now take place October 22nd through the 25th. They had originally been set for this weekend. Westbound lanes between Wabashaw and Marion Streets will close for pavement repair. The work will start at 10 p.m. that Friday and will open back up by 5 a.m. the following Monday. The work is part of a larger project to repair roads and upgrade walking and bicycling accessibility. Something wicked has taken over the Travail Basement Bar in Robbinsdale. They've partnered with the crew behind the haunted basement to create a Halloween themed dining experience inspired by classic horror films. There is a 10 course Halloween themed tasting menu and you can pair your dinner with some spooky drinks. We have been doing cocktail flights in the same way that you would do a tasting menu. So we're curating not only the drinks and the experience, but just kind of really honing in on everything so that you have an entire inclusive and immersive uh, dining and cocktail experience. Oh, that looks like a lot of fun. Well, if you are interested, you'll need to book a reservation and you can do that on travailkitchen.com. Oh, looks very fun. And the little Ghostbusters, little slime guy was there. All right, listen up, pie lovers. Buy your canned pumpkin while you still can. Farmers are warning of possible shortages ahead of the holiday season. Farmers say there's no shortage of pumpkins, actually, but supply chain issues could cause delays in getting canned pumpkins to the store shelves. In Morton, Illinois, where 90% of the country's pumpkins come from, the problem isn't at the farm. Uh, here at our farm, we've had a, just an incredible bounty this year. You know, it varies from farm to farm. The problem's not the farm, it's not the factory. They've been moving right along. The problem may be in the supply chain somewhere. I think it's really a story of just a delay, not a shortage. There you go. Stay calm, carry on. You could end up paying more for the pumpkins, too. That's because the cost of cans are actually going up as well. I must note, though, there are some deals out there. If you go looking, you can okay. find some pumpkins 
at a great price. Yeah, and you don't want to wait too long because yeah. the, um, the good ones will be picked over. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, I think I pick up a couple pumpkins every weekend. Yeah. It's like a, an addiction almost. I, well, I got to get more. I know. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. I know. Carving them out. Yeah. All right, still ahead tonight, gusty winds threaten to further fuel a fast-moving fire in Southern California. And Thursday Night Football is on Fox tonight. Beforehand, we have Vikings Live. We'll have a preview next. Another wildfire is scorching land in Southern California. The El Liso fire threatens dozens of homes, but strong wind gusts could impact firefighters. Since erupting Monday, the fire has charred more than 24 square miles of Santa Barbara. It's just 5% contained. It's threatening more than 100 homes, ranches, and other structures. Strong wind gusts have been making it difficult for air tankers to drop water on the fire. We had 40, 50 mile an hour winds on the top of the ridge where the fire started and uh, trying to fly and get down there was, was incredibly rough and uh, not, not a safe environment for us to be, be even trying to get some retardant on the, on the ground. Southern California largely avoided fire damage for much of the fire season as flames scorched the northern part of the state. 
So far this year, California wildfires have burned nearly 2.5 million acres. Minneapolis has joined a growing list of cities that are lifting water sprinkling restrictions as drought conditions continue to improve. The city has lifted the even odd water restrictions that have been in place since July. Minnesota DNR says that while the Mississippi River remains lower than normal, flows have been steadily recovering since mid-September. The city is still encouraging residents to conserve water when they can. So that's a little bit of good news yeah, after such a rough summer with the drought conditions and all the dry lawns and very dry um, and very difficult season for farmers. Yeah. So maybe we can head into the next season a little bit better shape. Absolutely. And you know what? I've been really hesitant to pull out that fall coat, hopefully. I mean, I imagine I'm not the only one. Have you pulled your coat out yet? I walked out with shorts on. I am not the right person to ask <laughs> at all. Like, <laughs> I don't know where any of my jeans are, oh. and I hate all of them anyway. So I, I have not oh, transitioned man. just yet. Yeah, okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> there you go. Oh, oh, See, this oh, is how you yeah. dress properly. Yes. This the is the coat that I wore today. You know why? <laughs> Do you want to know why? Because you're smart. Yeah. Because I listened to my forecast I last listen, night. I listen, I just, I just, uh, you know, I have not transitioned all the clothes yet. If you don't transition, <laughs> I'm going to make sure that's, if you don't transition, then you can't complain. I'm not complaining, I promise. Um, by the way, you should do like a dress code. We need to have like a, um, a fashion show. I'm doing a fashion show. show. Yeah, and every day on our website, we put a picture up of Ian. <laughs> What was that movie? I like that. That was um, uh, Ben Stiller. That's Blue Steel. Um, um, Zoolander. 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 Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are Zoolander right now. I'm keeping the coat on for the rest of the forecast, just to make sure that people know it is going to be um, cooler than average here as we work through the next few days. Look, pick up the spin here in parts of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, Canada. The flow here out of the northwest, and you've got a flow here out of the southwest. For the next couple of days, northwest flow winds. We will be cooler than average. Then into the day, late Saturday, but Sunday, the southwest flow takes over and will go warmer than average. The one constant is that it will be a very quiet forecast through the chill and the warm up all the way into next week. There's a live look at storm vision. We started with clouds today, but no real active weather in those clouds. But how about these temperatures, especially first thing this morning? Upper 40s for a high temperature in Hibbing, 51 in St. Cloud, 55 in Hutchinson, and as you get into the warm air, <clears throat> 61 in Red Wing. Winds were a big factor today. If you were outside without your jacket, Kelsey Carlson, then you absolutely felt the winds. Sustained winds 5 to 15 miles per hour out of the west. Occasional wind gusts 20 plus miles per hour still out of the west and we'll stay breezy tonight. Look at these current temperatures 47 in Brainerd, 45 in Bemidji, 49 in St. Cloud. I think you get the idea. Jackets absolutely and it's been a very, very mild if not warm fall and October so far. This is our latest first sub 60 degree day since 1872. Wow. Wow, if you'd have watched a forecast last night, you'd have known you'd have needed a coat. I wonder how excited they were in 1872. <laughs> 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 to have that <laughs> nice weather. <laughs> person who wore shorts today. 56 is where it. we topped out. Average high is 59. We know what we're wearing tomorrow, right? Tomorrow yes, morning? Yes, yes. What are we wearing tomorrow morning? We are wearing a jacket. A jacket, yes. a jacket, your fall coat. BC's a troublemaker. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. It is a very quiet stretch of weather as we get through a chill the next couple of days and then much warmer Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Quiet, yes. Jackets tomorrow, yes. Saturday morning, the possibility of frost, absolutely. Once again, what are we going to be wearing tomorrow morning? Yeah. I'm going to call BC. Oh, and BC's going to tell God. me what to wear. And you know what? Actually, I might even wear a hat. Yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. if you're out there for. Did your ring just go off on your? <laughs> yeah, my ring doorbell. Can you hear that? <laughs> a jingle that just came from the weather center. Well, it looks like uh, Baxter's going. Baxter's out. Outside. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> uh, Thursday night football is back on Fox tonight. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers will be facing off against the Philadelphia Eagles. This is a live look at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia, where the game is taking place. With those rowdy fans they have there in Philly, kickoff is set for 7:20. But we have Vikings live coming up beforehand.
Hobie Arteague, Ron Johnson, and Don Mitchell will take a look at what the Vikings need to do to come away with a win over the Panthers on Sunday. And they join us now with a preview. So, guys, uh, what are you looking at this week? Yeah, Kelsey, it should be a good game that you can catch right here on Fox 9 between the Bucks and the Eagles, of course, but also on Sunday, the big one between the Vikings and the Panthers before the bye week. And guys, the purple, trying to stay a little warm like Ian was in the studio a while ago <laughs> after that win against the Lions. Granted, it came down to crunch time for the Vikings to get their second win of the season, but they still pulled it off. What did that game against the Lions show you? Bye. Well, for me, it showed me that they're resilient. You know, mm -hmm. the big thing for Mike Zimmer was it's not always going to be pretty. It doesn't matter. The game is not like a video. It's just, it's what's the score? Did we win? Let's move on. It's weird to see fans mad about a win. Like, I don't understand that. People are mad that it came down to a field goal. Hey, just imagine if they had made the field goal before against the Cardinals. Just imagine about the Bengals yeah. game. All that kind of stuff. They could be a one-loss team right now. And they're probably one of the better two and three teams. And so I think that's the thing to look at. You have to continue to win. The Panthers are a winnable game. Get 500 before the bye week. You know, on the flip side of that, they also learned that they're lucky because they still had a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, lucky it comes down to a good field goal. But they also learned, listen, we got to get that that offense going in the second half. We, we've got to get those touchdowns. We've got to take advantage of takeaways that the defense give us. So there are a lot of plays left out on the table that I think they're saying, okay, we came away with the win. Now let's examine what can we do better. And I think they're gelling too I think especially on defense and we'll mm -hmm. talk about that later on tonight that they're starting to get together but they have the luxury of a, a W but seeing mm -hmm. what they really still need to improve on and you mentioned that offense only two touchdowns in the last two games that's going to have to change in Carolina if they want to get that win before the bye but uh, some good news Dalvin Cook today a full participant in practice Christian McCaffrey though did not practice the Panthers have said that he's a 50 50 shot to play and Dawn this game really could be coming down to this Sunday on which running back really steps up for his offense. You know, I think the good thing is Dalvin looked awesome at practice. This is the best I think I have seen him. So I hope Dalvin Cook comes out and he's fresh and he's ready to go. And the defense, you have to be ready for Christian McCaffrey, whether mm -hmm. or not he plays, right? Because even Eric Hendricks said today, he runs a little bit different than most backs. So you have to be prepared for what he brings. Yeah, I mean, with Dalvin Cook, again, he's a full participant, but an ankle, any twist, any turn, any weird step. I mean, we saw Chris McCaffrey's hamstring. He yeah. was fine, and all of a sudden, a weird step. He tries to do some kind of, you know, hezzy, and it just didn't go for him. Mm -hmm. And so with Dalvin Cook, getting him healthy. I think the other key is getting Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen healthy. Yeah. Like, if, if Dalvin is healthy and those two are not, you're going to have to run the ball. I mean, you have to look like what the Gophers wanted to look like, which is running the ball 40 times in a game and just slowing it down, not forcing Kirk to have to make too many plays. But again, it's the Carolina Panthers. Mm -hmm. We know Sam Darnold, if you get to him, which Everson Griffin and Daniel Hunter have been doing a great job of the best duo right now in football. Mm -hmm. They can make him see ghosts, and he's going to throw interceptions. We'll see later in some of the plays. And Justin Jefferson did not practice again today, to your point, but also Mike Zimmer joins us live with Paul Allen catching up for a one-on-one -on -one in our spotlight this week. Much more to come beginning at 6 o'clock for Vikings Live. Kelsey BC, back to you in studio. All right, Hobie, thank you. And you can watch all of the action this weekend right here on Fox 9, the official home of the Vikings. Our pre-game coverage starts at 10 o'clock Sunday morning, leading up to kickoff in North Carolina at noon. Then catch Vikings post-game tonight. It airs Sunday night at 1030, right after the news. Well, want to go to space but really can't afford a ticket on board a rocket these days? Coming up, a look at the new software letting people travel light years beyond our own galaxy.
The high cost of going to space is well beyond most people's budgets. But what if you could explore the entire universe without shelling out millions of dollars? Scientists in Switzerland have created a new software called the Virtual Reality Universe Project. The program processes information collected from multiple databases, letting you experience not just the moon and Mars, but also 50 million galaxies and 4,500 planets outside of our solar system. I think that's a great idea. Just, I like to have my, my feet planted mm -hmm. to the ground. Right. <laughs> so. An, an easier way to do right. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that'll do it for us here at 530. Yeah, but don't go anywhere because Vikings Live is straight ahead with Dawn and Ron and Hobie, and they'll be talking to Coach Zimmer. So it's going to be a great show coming up next. on the road now and three weeks at home so um, you know, you're kind of right back where you've been in terms of the work it takes and the preparation. Put away what you did last week and you start fresh and get ready for another week and a, and a great test for us. Going into the bye week with a win, just that confidence, just getting, getting it going for the second part of our, our, our schedule and you know, we're trying to even the score up. Luther Auto. And now to kick off your NFL weekend, this is Vikings Live. 
Looking good, PA. Looking good. What do you mean? You're just looking good tonight. Well, I got, I got, Ronald I'm, Johnson's looking good too. We're, we're playing Panthers and I'm sprouting wings, so you caught me at a <laughs> at a vulnerable moment. And plus, Zimmer's in the green room and he's already crotch, looking good. He's already crotchety. We haven't even started the interview, <laughs> and he can watch this. Welcome to Vikings Live, everyone. As the Vikings are looking good as they try to head into the bye week with a win against the Panthers this weekend, along with Ron Johnson and Paul Allen. I'm Hobie Artigue. Don Mitchell will join us in just a little bit. But guys, the Vikings getting that win against the Lions. Granted, it was a little closer than a lot of the experts expected, but still a win nonetheless in the NFL is a win. Vikings sitting at two and three, looking for another one before taking a little break. Ron, what have you liked about this team through five weeks? Resilience. I mean, so many teams would probably, you know, go in the tank when the kicker has a bad game. They stuck with them. Mike, Mike Zimmer seems like he's figured out the, cute, the kicker whisperer now. You know, he's taken a step back and said, if he misses a kick, he misses a kick. Let's make the next one. Mm -hmm. And he does that against the Lions. I think Kirk Cousins showing that he can. I mean, if he had made some of these other kicks and some of the stuff didn't happen, he would have three game-winning drives already this season. And so people have put a lot of emphasis on some of the bad, but you have to look at the good. They have won two games. They should have won more. But, hey, it's a long season. They've only lost three. People uh, seem to forget that, you know, granted this Lions team is winless, uh, but the Ravens are 4-1, and one, <laughs> and the Ravens could go to the Super Bowl from the AFC, and it took a 66-yard field goal to beat them. So, you know, everybody, the intel into the game was the Lions play really hard. They're really tough. Campbell's message is working. They're just depri deprived of talent. We saw that. Now, the way it ended, you, you don't want the fumble, but you do want the walk-off. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's from 2-3, and three, it's getting the defense and the offense to mesh obviously is so key but one or the other is getting the others back every single week mm -hmm. so if it comes together man i'm telling you they could beat any team in the nfl you mentioned the offense right now against seattle they looked pretty much unstoppable in that game they had a touchdown on the first drive against the browns but since then they've had only one touchdown in the last 112 minutes of game time oh. it seems like right out of the gate this offense is clicking and then they kind of hit a lull ron what needs to change before heading into that bye especially this weekend in carolina well, I mean, honestly, I'm not going to be cliche, but it is kind of, it's do what you do in the first drive because you script out those first 15 plays. Maybe, and Peyton Manning talked about this on the, the ESPN telecast he did, and it was, I sat there and I would look at my first 30 plays. Why? Because the game is not 15 plays. And maybe that's what Kubiak might need to do is, let's look at that next drive. We know our first drive is going to come out and punch them in the mouth because they don't know what to expect with our offense. Mm -hmm. Let's come back in that next drive and hit them again. And then I think it, from there, then you go to your card and you call it how it is. Um, other than that, I think Kirk Cousins is doing a good job. It's just defenses, for some reason, they're figuring it out. And some of the throws that are there early are not there late in the second half. Dalvin was full in practice today, so that's really, really good news. Now, with Kirk Cousins off what Ron said, you know, Kirk, Kirk's been, been mostly fantastic this year. When things are in a frenzy, like the end of the Cincinnati game, the Arizona, end of the Detroit game, he's been unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So I don't exactly know what the connection is with what comes into the huddle. There is no huddle. What, you know, what he hears and, and how he distributes it. But when things get, get willy-nilly and you just got to go fast, Kirk has been terrific. So I'm not saying, you know, like go up tempo, no huddle all the time, make the whole game a frenzy, but uh, that's kind of a hidden positive with him. And you mentioned Dalvin Cook being a full participant at practice today, and potentially this weekend we'll see two of the best in the game in the backfield. Hopefully we'll see some healthy running backs this weekend because Dalvin Cook and Christian McCaffrey have been a handful whenever you look at some of their stats since 2018. Christian McCaffrey, look, at, I mean, each mm. guy averaging five plus yards a touch. Each guy has 35 plus touchdowns, but the games played both guys have missed time over the last few years. It's no question that these are two of the top five running backs in the league. You could argue at this point in time. But PA, which running back do you feel is more valuable to their team heading into Sunday? McCaffrey's well, I, a 50-50 chance. Yeah, I, I think they're the best two running backs in the NFL because they're multifaceted. They, they catch, they run, they run between the tackles, they get outside, and they protect. So, I mean, that's with all due respect to Ezekiel Elliott and everybody else. But mm -hmm. when these guys are 100% and, like, full throttle, they're the best two running backs in the NFL. The Vikings... 
I would imagine somehow, and I'm going to get into this with uh, the coach when uh, when we sit down in those chairs, is the the team is two and zero with Alexander Madison. Yeah. But there has to be some component absolutely missing, not having Dalvin. Mm -hmm. If you're a Mike Zimmer or an elite defensive mind putting together a plan, maybe it's play action. I don't know. We'll get into it. Ron, how needed is Dalvin Cook to make sure you get to 500 before the bye? He's huge. I agree with PA on 50% of what he said. I think oh. Dalvin is up there, one. Uh -huh. I think right 1A and 1B is him and Derrick Henry. I'm going to put McCaffrey down with, like, oh, right on. below Kamara. Because I, I think my top three are going to be Alvin Kamara, Dalvin yeah. Cook, and Derrick Henry, and then McCaffrey. And the reason is because Dalvin can run between the tackles. Mm -hmm. McCaffrey is more of a zone, a true zone guy. You don't see him going up the middle like Dalvin. But PA is dead on. These two guys have to play. They're both really good running backs, and they are multifaceted. Mm -hmm. I I like the fact that Dalvin Cook, and I agree with that too, is the play action. When Dalvin Cook is in the game, the play action for Kirk is wide open. We're now looking at that defense for the Vikings, they took some criticism early in the season, but especially this last game, that second half against the Browns, forcing turnovers, getting to the quarterback. Ron, what stands out the most about what they're doing so well? Everson. I mean, Everson stands out. I mean, it's almost like he's he's back in like 28-year-old Everson Griffin. Mm -hmm. Him and Daniil Hunter with 10, I think 10 sacks combined are the number one duo for getting to the quarterback. I think he's been a huge help because we know what Daniil can do and having Ev, because everybody's like, it's a DJ Wanham hood, it's Everson. And Everson is playing his role well. He's listening. He's doing what he has to do. And then everybody else feeds off those two guys' sure. energy. And that's what I like the most. That second half defense, fourth in the NFL, second last week with points allowed. They were first for a second before DeAndre Swift got in, then they got that two-point conversion. Uh, the second half defense has become really, really stingy. And from a run defense standpoint, you know, I would imagine coach would want it better in totality because he's a perfectionist. But really, there have been some big spot runs, Hobie. Chris Carson, 39-yard touchdown. Mm -hmm. Kareem Hunt got that 33. DeAndre Swift with the unexpected run late. If they can lock up those big spot runs, then I think people would look at the defense a little differently. Especially, too, whenever Eric Kendricks is making one-handed interceptions, mm. might be lining up at tight end because there might be a <laughs> position of need moving forward for the Vikings. But sticking with that defense, they're really shining right now, is that group and that core. A lot of guys who have played a lot of football together. And for more on that side of the ball, we toss it now to Dawn Mitchell, who heard from some of the guys earlier today. Yeah, talking about that second half defense. Well, the defense wants to take that and unleash it in the first half, right? They also want to limit the runs, of course. They said they're not worried about their run defense, but they want to tighten that up and no splash, splash plays. But you get Everson Griffin back. Anthony Barr is back. And you're starting to see the identity of this defense come to mind. And also a little bit of fun again. Every season, it's a little bit different, obviously, but with two parts of the core back in Anthony Barr and Everson Griffin, the familiar ease is returning. For Eric Hendricks, having Barr back is like getting your right hand back. Me and Shu, we were, you know, we obviously went to college together. We, you know, we were in the same coaching staff and um, just through the beginning of the NFL. So we kind of just do things very similar as far as how we think and, uh, you know, what kind of checks we make first. And, and I feel like uh, it's just, you know, it's just nice for sure. Getting Everson Griffin back on the roster and to form has been a nice bonus. In four games, he has four sacks and a forced fumble. Oh, um, man, he's an animal. He's, he's a sack daddy for a reason. You know, he finds a way to get to the quarterback. He's uh, very ferocious, you know, nonstop, has that, that motor um, that never dies. You know, Everson's going Everson, you know, um, sack daddy. So that's what's up. <laughs> And of course, Eric Kendricks is also playing well. His one-handed interception against the Lions, so fun to watch. He says his game has matured, but it's a fine balance to keep that childlike spark as well. He's never going to have a, a problem having the childlike uh, mentality. He, he's always bouncing around. Every time he runs out of the tunnel, he's, he's running out like he's a school kid going out to recess. It is a balance, you know what I mean? Um, you got to trust your instincts as well, you know. Um, but you also, you know, like, this a game, the game of football, you know, at this level, it gets so serious so often. And I mean, obviously, it's our job. You know, we're trying to go out there and win games every every Sunday. But in the same breath, you know, it is a game. You know what I mean? You got to kind of treat it like that, um, for the enjoyment purposes, and you know, to keep it fresh. You know. Fresh. They have the balance. They also now have veterans at every position back there. And I think Ek said it the best, right? That's what's up. So, the defense is up. <laughs> Back to you. Don, thank you very much. Uh, 
the Panthers were trending up toward the start of the season, came out of the gate, won three straight games, but since then have lost back to back. Uh, what is your read on this Panthers team, Ron, heading into a game that could decide the trajectory for either team heading into the rest of 20. Yeah, I hate to call it must win, but it is for both. Second I mean, time that you said I that know, this year. I know, I hate too. to do it, but it is. It's a must win game because you're right. This is going to kind of decide. Three and three, a three and three Vikings coming out of the bye still have a chance to, you know, be in the wild card six or seven spot. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Packers could still come back to the pack too, and that's the big difference. The Panthers, they have a lot of work to do. I mean, you got the Buccaneers who are looking really good right now. And, you know, they're trying to do the same thing. They want that wild card spot. So, yeah, this is going to be a big weekend for them. Yeah, the, you see there on the graphic, the Panthers have lost their last two. I mean, Ron's up here making it sound like Chuba Hubbard's better than Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> but the two Christians been out. The Panthers have lost both. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I'm, not, I'm not in love with their roster. And, you know, they have a safety second year from a Southern Illinois named Jeremy Chin. I'm in love with him. Burns and, um, and, and Reddick, they combined for 10 sacks. And they got a nice tackle in Derrick Brown. Rest of that, man, I'm just not in love with their roster. Vikings beat them last year in a spine tingler. Bad season for the Vikings last year. I'm, I, I think the Vikings win Sunday. And Jeremy Chin had a huge game, oh. if, I'm, uh, if I do not say it corrected, that last time that they played a year ago. But whenever you look at this Panthers team, a new quarterback leading the way for Carolina this year, Sam Darnold. Uh, he had six touchdowns, of course, but also six picks, three, including in the last game, Ron. Yeah, I mean, it, the thing is, is I'm not going to do the whole he saw ghost, but you'll see in the plays when we go through them, he's in the end zone and he's moving faster than what the play is allowing. And he's looking the play, he's looking the receiver down too long. And when you look the receiver down, you're going to see in this play that the safety can easily break on it. And I think that's the problem is he, his eyes are telling the safeties exactly where to go. So here's a good Sam Darnold, which he's going to throw on timing. He knows it's basically a, a concept high low. That, that linebacker, that safety jumps to low. He's going to throw the dig. He puts it in there early enough where the safety can't get a big hit on his receiver. But this next one is simple cover two. There's nobody threatening the flat because the linebacker has it. So that corner, instead of sitting in the flat, he's just going to fade back with that receiver. And the safety never is told to go anywhere else but to that because he's like, you're staring this guy down. I'm just going to follow your eyes. And that's just bad Sam Darnold. He's in the end zone, and that's why he sped it up. And you mentioned how well Christian McCaffrey helps this offense, PA. But Chuba Hubbard, the rookie out of Oklahoma State, can really do some damage if he finds the opportunity. Well, well, Chuba, when he came out of Oklahoma State, was lauded for his vision. Now, in, in watching back some of his plays, he, you know, Coach Zimmer knows more about this than me, but... He doesn't seem like the biggest threat in the world getting outside. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't seem super fast. 3.9 per carry guy, still zero TDs. It's incredible. If we can show you some of those plays right now here, he's out looking to go outside, PA. Right, and you're, but uh, this is more about the Eagles, in my opinion. I mean, I'm not an elite film watching mine, but my man right there falls. Uh, Darius Slay with the worst corner attempt tackle in the history uh, of football. And, and then Hubbard is made to look faster than he is. Now, this is nice. I mean, he plants, and there he goes. 57 got blocked up nicely. And that right there is big time Chuba Hubbard. I just don't envision it being these long and these mm -hmm. loose type runs. Uh, but he was lauded for his vision coming out of Oklahoma State. Seems, uh, seems to be a smart kid, uh, but uh, doesn't catch it much. Still zero TDs. How'd they do in the film breakdown? You think Pretty so? good. All right. If the wow. head coach yes. says it was good, that's good enough for me. Yes. As you can My tell, still much more to come on Vikings Live. We're joined by the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, Mike Zimmer, joining us live in studio to go one-on-one -on -one in our spotlight this week with Paul Allen. Stay tuned. Much more Vikings Live coming up after the break. Yeah.
Welcome back to Vikings Live. Brought to you by Miller Lite and Luther Auto. Snap, spot, Joseph, excellent leg, get up there, and yes, it is good! He's like that! He's like that! He's like that! Well, when push came to shove against the Lions last week, the Vikings pulled out a win against Detroit in crunch time. And it also, as you saw, led to some friendly pushing and shoving between Mike Zimmer and his starting quarterback. But now it's time for Zim to help push his team to 500 this weekend in Carolina. And for more with the Vikings head coach, we now send it over to Paul Allen in this week's Spotlight with the one and only Mike Zimmer. Hobie, right on. You shoved him so hard. He's half your age. Why'd you shove him so hard? He pushed me pretty hard, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get back at him. So with the, you like that. You like that was like, I don't. I don't. And here's Dan Campbell looking around going, hey, where's Mike? We're supposed to shake hands here, you know? Yeah, well, there's a lot, lot of uh, emotions going on at that, that point in the ball game, you know. Uh, got the game in hand. They got to, you know, they come back. We fumbled the ball. I got a chance to, to win the game. And then uh, Kirk takes us down a two-minute drill, and, and we kick the field goal to win. Well, what I said earlier with Ron and Hobie, with, with Kirk, when it becomes a frenzy, end of Arizona, Cincinnati, there. I mean, he's just naturally good at that, just getting there quickly and, and making lickety-split decisions, right? Yeah, I, I think he's getting really comfortable with those two-minute drills. I think he's getting really comfortable with uh, offensively when the things kind of break down and he's got to move around and make some plays. He's been working on it, uh, you know, uh, all spring and this fall, and, and he's doing a good job. Well, when I saw you after that Lions game, game Zim, you were just exhausted, exasperated. I mean, did the media wear you out with the press conference? <laughs> no, that was that was the least part of it. <laughs> it was uh, the 60 minutes of the ball game. That yeah, did. and then the way it ended, it's you know, like the Carolina game last year. That you know, BB muffs the punt, then he wins the game. It's every game you have this year is a nail biter. I mean, how's your heart? Well, I got to start taking my blood pressure medicine for sure. Jeez, uh, well, but these games are super exciting, right? Yeah, they're exciting. We 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 need to make them a little less exciting. Now, you uh, when you talked about Dan Campbell and the Lions into that game, and you know a lot of people thought it was cliche with how people are describing the Lions. He has them playing tough. You know, they 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 don't have the greatest talent in the world right now, but they will fight tooth and nail for you. And you saw that right to the end. This Carolina defense seems like it has some fight to it too. Yeah, they've got talented players, and uh, they're they're going to bring guys from every every area that they can. The nickelback, the corners, the linebackers. Uh, they got two great edge rushers. Uh, the guys in the middle are, are stout. They give you a lot of different looks. The corners sit on all the routes. So um, you know it'll be it'll be a a, a very competitive a combative day for us. Now, I mentioned Dalvin Cook went full in practice today. No guarantee he plays this weekend, but that's good news. And and Trey Boston no longer is on their team, so we don't have to worry about anybody trying to break his ankle at the end of the pile, at uh, the bottom of the pile, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that happened in Arizona, if I remember right. Yeah, but the, I mean, they it, it was at U.S. Bank Stadium. I think it was Trey Boston. Yeah, I know, but I was talking about. Oh, it happened. Somebody else did it. A couple weeks ago. Whoa. In, in Arizona, maybe. What's happening? Do, are you getting with Commissioner Goodell saying, "Have these players stop trying to break my players' bones"? Yeah, my poor guy. You know, he's just he's just trying to play football. You um um you guys, as I mentioned, are always always in nail biters. And as I said earlier, and I mean it, it's if you can get that offense and defense to mesh and game after game after game, honestly, I think there's you could beat any team in the National Football League. But with the offense the way it's gone of late, last two and a half games. You know, what is slowed and what do you think will change? Well, we did a lot of um, research this past Monday. I had all of the offensive coaches do a lot of research on uh, a lot of different areas, second half possessions, uh, what we're doing after a penalty, what we're doing after a uh, earned first down, what we're doing after a, a sack, um, you know, all the different scenarios that, that we have and uh, what we're doing in the red zone. And so I think we've, we've found some tendencies that we need to fix. And, uh, you know, so hopefully that'll, that'll uh, show up this week. You're 2-0 you're and with Madison, but I have to imagine when Cook doesn't play that there, there's something, you know, the defenses are, are just laying off of making it tougher to get yards. Is that fair? Yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, they, they – uh, like Detroit last week, they did a really good job of changing up the coverages and still being able to stop the run. So if we can, if we can get to um, 
you know, these guys getting down into more eight-man boxes with Dalvin in there, then I think we'll have some more success throwing the football as well. Lastly, through the, uh, through the two and three, you, you have contended. I know what a bad team looks like. This is not a bad team. This is a good team. What, what are some indicators into this game that, you know, helps fans and or you keep the faith? Well, like I said, I've been doing this for 27 years. So I, I've seen um, less talented teams. I've seen more talented teams maybe, but the way these guys work together and the things that they can do as a collectively as a group, um, whether it's special teams or offense or defense, you know, when you look at Jefferson and Thielen and, and uh, Cook and Cousins, um, uh, Tyler uh, Conklin, you look at these guys, you look at Brian O'Neill, you look at some of, the, some of those things they do, and then you look at defensively and you got Everson and Hunter and Barr and Kendricks and, and uh, Dalvin Tom, yeah, and Harry, um, Peterson, yeah. you know, it's a collectively good group, and uh, it's taken us a little bit while to gel. Um, you know, I'm not sure why, but once we do gel, we're going to be dangerous. Thanks for the chat. Good luck this weekend. All right, thanks, Paul. Hobie, Zim B and Zim. Zim, always appreciate your time. Thank you. Still to come here on Vikings Live, we take a look at Thursday night football. Tonight it's in Philly as the Bucks take on the Eagles. We chat about that when we return here on Vikings Live. You're watching Vikings Live. Brought to you by Miller Lite and Luther Auto. Well, before we look ahead to Thursday Night Football, the big game for the Vikings against the Panthers coming up on Fox 9 at noon on Sunday. Ron, a key to victory for the Vikings. They have to establish the run and they have to eliminate the big plays by the Carolina Panthers. Simple. Cousins running his career high 41 last year at Tampa. He's going to break that this weekend. Uh -huh. The way they play defense, it is a run fest for a quarterback. Watch him take advantage. Oh, look at this. Kirk Vick. We'll see if we see it on <laughs> Sunday. Uh, as for tonight, Thursday night football, of course, it's the Bucks at the Eagles. Mm -hmm. uh, Philly kind of trending and just floating there. Tampa, though, looks like a bus. So who you got tonight? I got Tampa because he's mad about the Eagles taking the championship from him. Tampa, low scoring game. 
low scoring yeah. game. Yeah. I think that the Eagles could have a chance to win this thing, oh. but Jalen Hurts has to play out of his mind. Uh, Buccaneers, Buccaneers have key injuries, so yes, careful, they do. But, Antoine Winfield Jr. One yep, of those, and Levante David. Uh, Bucks low scoring. All righty, that'll do it for us here on Vikings Live. We'll see you Sunday for Vikings Game Day Live before that game between the Vikings and the Panthers at noon on Sunday.
a bad gut feeling when we couldn't get a hold of anyone. Um, I thought that was really weird. Next at seven, more complaints flowing in for a North Dakota photography company that made headlines last week after abruptly closing its doors. Plus, another coronavirus booster shot gets the green light from an FDA panel. And a moment of remembrance and reflection at 38th in Chicago as community members mark what would have been George Floyd's 48th birthday. This is Fox 9 News at 7. Thanks for joining us at 7. The lawyer for a North Dakota wedding photography company, which suddenly closed, now says they have a plan for couples and newlyweds across several states left scrambling. The number of complaints filed with the North Dakota Attorney General's office has exploded from 50 complaints just a week ago to 480 as of today. Leah Bino has been following this and learned many don't see the owner's new plan as much help at all. I stressed about other stuff, but I did not stress about photography up until Thursday when we got that email. 14 days prior to her October 22nd wedding, Megan Lentz and her fiance learned Glasser Images they hired for photography was closing. Within minutes, she did what it has taken Glasser and his new attorney seven days to suggest for couples left scrambling and contacted the subcontracted photographers for her big day. Everyone was put in such a bad situation. Um, and for them to just be like, oh, reach out to your subcontractors, um, they can help you. It's like, well, you're missing a big key piece here is money. While Lens is out a couple thousand dollars, so is photographer Brad Siegel and hundreds more. He worked seven weddings for Glasser this summer and hasn't been paid for any. He also filed complaints with the North Dakota and Minnesota Attorney General's offices. And while Glasser's new attorney suggests in this letter providing information to the North Dakota Department of Labor, Siegel is worried he may never see a dime. In my opinion, it's still very muddy. It's not clear, not clear enough what we're supposed to do. For weddings that have already taken place, like the Van Gilders, Glasser's attorney states they are attempting to make arrangements with subcontractors to provide the electronic data files and video to outside photographers and videographers. For subcontractors, there will not be copyright issues, but still, when asked about owed wages or refunds, Glasser's attorney has no comment. I want to pursue every avenue possible to get paid for the work we've done. The North Dakota Attorney General's office has filed subpoenas for both Jack Glasser and his company. In the meantime, the Facebook page bringing together people impacted by this has swelled to almost two and a half thousand members. Leah Bino, Fox 9. New court documents detail the defense strategy for Kim Potter's upcoming trial. They show defense attorneys are expected to argue that former officer Kim Potter's fatal shooting of Dante Wright last spring was an accident. Potter is charged with first and second degree manslaughter. She reportedly mistook her firearm for her taser during a traffic stop last April in Brooklyn Center. Prosecutors argue Potter's actions created a greater than normal danger to others. Her schedule, her trial is scheduled to begin November 30th. A Minneapolis man is now charged in connection to a hit and run at a busy intersection in North Minneapolis that killed a woman on a mobility scooter. 21 year old Cameron Benson is charged with one count of criminal vehicular homicide. Investigators say he ran a red light and hit Rosie Means as she moved through a crosswalk Monday afternoon. Police arrested Benson the next morning after his vehicle was found crashed in a median on Highway 100 in Brooklyn Park with the interior set on fire. The day before the deadly hit and run, witnesses called police to report seeing him high on drugs and driving his white Jeep. Community members coming together tonight at the corner of 38th in Chicago to mark a special moment. Today would have been George Floyd's 48th birthday. Courtney Godfrey shows us how people are marking the moment. And today would have been George Floyd's 48th birthday. He died almost a year and a half ago here on Chicago Avenue in a police incident. Today, Floyd's family came here to this intersection to celebrate the impact that he's left. Spearheading the celebrations is the George Floyd Global Memorial Nonprofit Foundation led by Floyd's aunt and cousin. The purpose of the foundation is to preserve everything you see out here, the art, the statues made and maintained by this community. 
It's become a gathering place for people advocating for police reform and racial justice. And it's even become somewhat of a tourist attraction, attracting people from all over the world. The family says being out here today means everything to them. They say Floyd loved bringing people together, loved a celebration, and so that is what they want tonight to be about. It's just a beautiful thing to recognize him because his name, it, it, it just changed. It changed the world, what happened. And it means a whole lot because change is still moving and it's still going, just bringing people together, unity. With thousands of pieces collected, eventually this organization plans to find a permanent home for all of these pieces where generations to come can learn about Floyd's legacy. As for this celebration out here tonight, it plans to go through as for this celebration out here tonight, there will be live music, performances, free food, and you can see people are just coming and going. This celebration expected to go through the night. Reporting in Minneapolis, Courtney Godfrey, Fox 9.